I'm very pleased to be able to introduce two colleagues from VASPAR's student support team, Bridget Ferguson and Kerry Morgan, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves in a moment when they begin their presentation. But really pleased that, to have them along. Again, we felt that it was important to learn from those in our institution that um, think about issues of inclusivity and accessibility um, as part of their, their role. And so given that this project will get us to work closely with students and students who have accessibility uh, uh, challenges, that that will, that makes it a really important for us to hear from those who support students. And so here we'll be hearing from colleagues at Bath Spa, but at other uh, training events and in other uh, situations, uh, we may well hear from, from similar teams at your institution. So uh, Bridget and Kerry, over to you. You have the ability to share the screen, so the floor is yours. Thank you, Ian. Um, my name is Bridget Ferguson. I'm the Deputy Head of Student Wellbeing Services. Uh, and just to give you a description of me, I am a white woman in my 40s wearing glasses, uh, working from my home office, which is actually my landing. Um, and Kerry, over to you. So hi, so I'm Kerry. I'm an accessibility advisor at Bathsbar University. So working with Bridget, I'm working in my spare bedroom, <laughs> which I've made into quite a nice office, I think. Um, I have white hair. I'm a white woman wearing black. So just starting with a little bit of an overview of this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about our student demographic and the legal context in which we're working going to talk a bit about the barriers to learning and the different kinds of accessibility and I'm going to talk about accessibility in the context of disabled students and also ways that we are increasing accessibility at Bath Spa. So firstly our student demographic, a very kind of broad brush approach, um, but we have almost a quarter of students identify as disabled which is considerably, considerably more than the UK average of 14%. Uh, we have a low number of international students, 6.5% compared to 22% in UK universities. We have a high proportion of women, almost 70% of our students are women compared to 56% in other universities. And we have a small proportion of students who identify as black, Asian or minority ethnic. 10% compared to 26.3% in UK universities. That's largely because we have students that predominantly um, live in this area of the country and we live in a very white area of the country in the southwest. So here are some of the priority groups that student wellbeing services work with. Uh, we work a lot with students who identify as disabled, those requiring mental health support, those who have been in care, those who are estranged from their families or have lived in a foyer, and those who have non-parental caring responsibilities. The legal context that we're working in, we're working under the Equality Act. So we are subject to the public sector equality duty um, as a higher education institution. That uh, duty lists nine protected characteristics and they relate to age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, gender reassignment, pregnancy and maternity, race, marriage or civil partnership and religion or belief. And the university has a requirement to eliminate harassment and discrimination and enhance equality of opportunity between those with those protected characteristics and those without. Uh, those students who identify as disabled also fall under the Equality Act. So this act gives a legal definition of disability as being a physical or mental impairment that has a substantial and long-term effect. So that's essentially something that's going on for 12 months or more and has an impact on daily um, activities and the university has a legal requirement to make reasonable adjustments um, for students who identify as disabled. 
So here is a visual of our disabled uh, versus non-disabled students. So as you can see, almost a quarter. And this is a breakdown of uh, the conditions that those students have. So as you can see, the vast majority fall under two categories, those with specific learning differences, the most common of those being dyslexia, and those who have a mental health condition, which is 33% of students. So that's the fastest growing um, category of disabled students. Um, we have 5% on the autism spectrum, uh, which is considerably more than the UK average of 1% of the population. So just to get, give a little bit of a rundown of those uh, main categories. Um, so we've got students with specific learning differences. So dyslexia, ADHD, dyspraxia and dyscalculia fall under that definition. And some of the common um, barriers are working and short term memory uh, impairment, visual processing issues, uh, reading speed and comprehension and concentration issues. Although actually symptoms can vary hugely between different students, it's very much an individual thing. And it's also not uncommon for students to have a number of uh, presenting differences, for example, dyslexia and ADHD and dyspraxia. And it can have a quite significant impact on students' mental health and well-being. So we're often working with two teams, the mental health team and the accessibility team. So mental health being our, our second biggest category, this is by far from an exhaustive list of mental health conditions, but the most common that present to us are depression, anxiety, self-harm, suicidal ideation, panic attacks and eating disorders. And some of the impacts that mental health can have on students is their ability to attend taught sessions, their engagement with materials, their comp comprehension of materials and their ability to complete or submit assessed work. Um, I've certainly had several students that have completed assessed work and not been able to submit it. Uh, due to anxiety or the need for it to, to feel that it needs to be more perfect. So there are many um, ways that mental health can impact. So autism spectrum condition, a very brief overview. This affects how students communicate and interact with the world. They may have difficulties or differences in social communication and interaction and sensory differences. So this can include uh, sensitivity to light and sound. Um, and textures. It very much affects people differently to different degrees um, and some inclusive measures that can help uh, students on the autism spectrum include uh, being very clear with your speech and instructions, um, providing routine and structure where that's possible and providing materials in advance. So very fluid timetables and surprises um, are difficult for autistic students often to um, manage. And a uh, very big category here, long-term medical conditions and mobility impairments and sensory impairments. So as with all uh, the other categories, these can be both visible and invisible and they can impact on attendance, ability to take notes or engage in talk sessions. And some examples of uh, invisible conditions include diabetes, epilepsy, chronic fatigue syndrome, and fibromyalgia, and visible conditions, um, cerebral palsy and quadriplegia. Obviously, there are many, many different conditions. They're just a few examples. So ways to enhance accessibility. I'm basically looking at uh, how we enhance accessibility on an individual level, and then looking at how we do that on an institution level. And um, we could probably also talk a long time about how that can happen on a society and a global level, but we haven't got very long, so I'm limiting it, limiting it to the individual and the institution. So the, here are some of the ways that we help individual students. So those students who are eligible, so with the evidence um, of uh, a condition or disability are eligible for disabled students allowance. Uh, that doesn't include international students. 
but we do have funding to uh, fund students within the university who aren't eligible for disabled students allowance. Uh, accessibility advisors are a key point of contact for disabled students and help them to access uh, support that they need and they also pre prepare academic access plans for students. So these are the documents that list reasonable adjustments that disabled students might need in order to access um, their learning properly. We also have, um, for students that are uh, have mental health conditions, an enhanced support process. So this is a process for students that present the highest risk, um, either to themselves or others. So it's often students that are actively suicidal or significantly self-harming. And we have uh, a support to study process, which can support any student that is struggling either with their academic studies or with independent living. We also have um, some transition events for disabled students, which help introduce them to the university and to accommodation and give them an overview of support measures at the university before they arrive. And that includes an event for autistic students, which is particularly helpful in lessening um, that sense of surprise and newness and uh, developing some familiarity before teaching starts. So a little bit more about academic access plans because this is a key document for uh, teaching staff. It's available, it's pre prepared by Student Wellbeing Services and available to all academic um, staff who have students with, with a plan. And it's a document outlining uh, any reasonable adjustments that are needed. I've listed a few very common ones here, which can include the student needing extra time, alternative assessments, alternative arrangements for presentations, and um, an awareness that a student may need uh, more absence than usual. So there, there are many, many more, but that's just some of the common ones that uh, appear in plans. So how are some of the ways that as an institution that we increase accessibility? I think this is super key. Um, ideally, we have an, an environment that's so accessible that the need for individual adjustments is minimal, although it's always going to be necessary for some students. But the more we increase accessibility as an institution, the more we increase um, essentially that the learning capacity of all students, not, not just those with those categories that we have, have listed and disabled students. So this is a strategic priority for the university this year, and that includes the development of an inclusivity toolkit, which is an ongoing piece of work. But one of the things that has been produced so far is a very comprehensive readiness checklist for academic staff to check that their teaching modules are accessible and um, this is very, a very small proportion of uh, the things that uh, staff need to, to check that they have in place. So that is recording lectures and captioning their lectures, providing materials 48 hours in advance, making sure that their font type and size is appropriate and accessible and that the background is um, visible and making sure that their uh, content is inclusive and diverse and that includes reading and material lists. So that's a big piece of work going on at the university um, this year. So here are some final thoughts. I think it's really important to remember that uh, barriers to accessibility for students are often invisible and in terms of creating an inclusive environment for everybody, I think it's really important to consider accessibility from the outset as opposed to a kind of final thought add on. So that can be both about the physical environment. Obviously, if you're in a place that is uh, building buildings from scratch, that is one of the requirements. Uh, but in terms of existing buildings, looking in your teaching space and like, have I, have I got a layout that is accessible to all students? Are my teaching materials accessible? Is the content of my teaching materials accessible? And in terms of the institution, are our policies accessible? And what's really important to ensure that is that they are undergoing an equality impact assessment from the very outset, again, not as a last minute add-on. 
and um, an equality impact assessment is essentially exactly what it says. It's a tool to help universities ensure that their policy, policies and practices are fair and meet the needs of their staff and students and that they're not inadvertently discriminating against any protected group. One of the things that I was thinking about uh, as you were talking is that, as you know, we are multiple institutions and so in part our own sort of institutional structures and policies and then our own national frameworks, given we're international, have do shape what we can do and, and how we approach things. But I, I was I was also thinking about well what are the things that we as a project collaboratively can do? I mean we we're at the start of this process. Uh, accessibility was very much in the in in the you know at the core of what the project was as it was being developed. So you know the the key and most active members of the project from the start have, have been really thinking about accessibility, but we're going to have to bring in colleagues and students as the project develops who won't necessarily be as uh, uh, familiar or, or as knowledgeable about that. So I was thinking about one of the things that we could, you know, those things that uh, um, you provide, as it were, for Bar Spa, whether those are things that we could adapt and uh, apply more collaboratively. So, so, you know, something around that inclusivity checklist, um, and and also, could you talk a little bit about the equality impact assessment? Is that something that is sort of a national framework, or is that something we've developed? Because it may be yeah, something no, that's, that we've... that's a national. Um, it's a national thing. I'm not sure where it falls under. I'd have to do a bit of research on that. But it's essentially it is a tool for higher education institutions. It's uh, often a, a last minute add on. Uh, that people kind of go, oh, and let's tick the equality impact assessment box. And actually, what's really important is that that's considered at the very beginning. So um, rather than developing a project and then going, oh, is it accessible? It's like, actually, these are the things we need to consider from the outset. You know, what's the content of our material? Is that accessible? Is it inclusive? Is it diverse? How are we presenting that material? So, you know, obvious things are um not presenting material all in one way as i did apologies <laughs> but not you know it's it's important to have the visual some people absorb information through diagrams some people need sound some people um need materials in advance and that's a super common and very important one actually that's has often been overlooked that students um actually with both mental health conditions and specific learning differences that not exclusively those but often having material in advance is a huge benefit because there's that ability to start to comprehend and absorb information before they're in the teaching session so they can actually concentrate in the teaching session whereas for lots of disabled students that's going to be it's a lot of information to absorb being able to have access in advance gets them up to a level playing field with with other students and Kerry will certainly attest to that that that's often a difficulty that students with dyslexia face uh, but certainly not exclusive to them so yeah I think diversity in terms of presentation of material um, I don't know enough about your project to know how it's being presented but just that awareness of the kind of wider context of other barriers to accessibility, for example, poverty, um, other commitments, whether that's working full time or caring responsibilities, uh, all also impact, you know, as, as do students who identify as disabled, you know, have those barriers as well. So it's, it's that kind of like having that state of mind from the beginning, as opposed to kind of thinking of it as, as a last minute thing. Um, Kerry, you can probably add some useful stuff here. Yeah, I'm not sure I can, Bridget. I think you've covered it um, really well. But um, I think the only thing I would kind of add is that if those things aren't considered, the impact um, is quite considerable. Um, and in terms of allowing someone to fully access their course or to get the most out of their course, um, if the courses aren't accessible, don't have those accessibility features, it, you know, that does have an impact on their experience of university. Yeah, I think that's really important because you can be the best 
tutor, you know, the most brilliant academic with the most brilliant material, um, if you don't make that accessible, all of that becomes meaningless. So it's it's actually, you know, it's an absolute keystone to being an effective educator is to consider accessibility and not just have it as an afterthought. No, I, I, I agree entirely. And, and, and actually just on um, your point about the, the, the kind of range of accessibility barriers, actually that was something that was built into the project from the start that although uh, um, uh, disabled students are very much uh, a group that we're wanting to engage with, we're also uh, wanting to work with students who uh, um, have sort of suffer from a technology gap particularly given that we're this is a project that's 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 about technology you know what, what happens if they don't have the, the latest equipment or they have poor internet uh, but also students for whom um, studying uh, is taking place alongside other responsibilities that mean that they can't necessarily meet synchronously at the same time as everybody else or they can't you know they may be working at odd hours or in different ways so so yes absolutely that that's very much part of the the projects uh, uh, at the core of the project in terms of the the, the, the student uh, groups that we want to to reach um so that i think is is yes we, we we're pleased to hear that that works uh, um, that, that aligns with the, the way that you approach uh, um, student support. Okay, so this is kind of a little bit off the top of my head, so I'll have to have a have a think. Um, I, I think uh, maybe a starting point would be that they come in as creative artists and they perhaps don't fully appreciate that a degree is is more than doing art so there are and even the doing art has to be kind of reflected on and commented on and analyzed and that may be in a written form so um so possibly my experience starts off with a, a, a perhaps sometimes and not a, not the right expectation of what they're going to be doing while on a degree course so maybe um the transition perhaps from um, college or school where they've worked in quite small groups with the, with one teacher, maybe with um, a support assistant in, in the classroom, that transition to, um, you know, the university and kind of being a much more independent learner and taking responsibility for finding out where they need to be when they and when they need to be there. Right? So that whole kind of transition from from their school or college to university um, and perhaps the good strategies that they have in place which they have used to get to come to university maybe become a little bit more shaky while they kind of work out how to put those strategies in place at university so um so so things like um you know a, a very flexible timetable that quite often can be something managing the timetabling, mani managing all the different kind of systems of finding out where things are and where to look for information, um, remembering passwords, um, being in the right place at the right time, all, all of those things which become easier as they progress initially are kind of often really um, difficult for students with specific learning differences. Um, what else? I think um, you you mentioned um, Bridget things like um, readings and things having having that in good time. Um, I think if if they're put on the spot or expected to read something in a seminar and then discuss it, that's quite difficult. Um, um, often even if they are fine, able to do that, their whole confidence around learning and their um, resilience to kind of those kinds of things, it, you know, they lack confidence. And so that can feel more daunting um, than perhaps it, it thought it should do. So, um, so just, yeah, just everything kind of in good time, in plenty of time so they can organize their time. Um, students often, a specific learning differences is such a broad field so it's actually quite difficult to generalize but 
often students with dyslexia are very hard working students and often um, they're very organized students so they like to have everything in good time to allow them to do that so that they are like that because that's how they manage their course often um, things that might be quite mundane in terms of what you do is in, in terms of uh, working groups that can often cause some kind of um, concern or anxiety about who they're with um, how the group will work whether the group will accept how they work whether the group will work in a way that is the way that they work that is quite a common kind of concern as well um, asking i think asking whether they can ask for something so is it okay to ask is it okay to say i don't get this um you know with the academic access plans there's a lot of discussion often about you know does my tutor know do, do i just wait for my tutor to do what the recommendations are in the plan um and i kind of say the plan is kind of your empowerment to ask so it's kind of a two-way dialogue it, you know things don't just happen you, you perhaps need to have a conversation and that your academic access plan empowers you or ask or enables you to kind of to say you know can can i i don't get this can we go through it again um yeah i don't know is there any have i covered enough things do you think? That, that's great you get it you're getting you you you've, you've definitely uh, um what you've been saying has resonated with 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 colleagues uh, uh in the chat um one thing that um struck me while you were talking which again it would be interesting to hear your perspective as 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 uh, um uh, from student support so the the project um as a project was responding to a funding call that was about the impact of covid and um one of the things that with the way we designed the the course and particularly the way that the student will get student uh, uh comments and uh, uh feedback so one element of that is that there will be um in in about two three weeks time we will be uh circulating questionnaires to the the students and to staff in uh, art and design across the partners um uh and those will be aimed at students who have had at least one year of prior higher education experience, uh, um, or at least post school experience, and how uh, um, and how COVID has impacted their learning over that year. And then the feedback we'll get from that will be supported by some focus group work, um, which will be trying to get to the sort of detail of, of this and thinking about what it is that really uh, what were the real challenges of the last year, but also, and we discussed this in the earlier training session, that some of the technology that we've relied on has some enabling factors as well. It's made some things possible in a way that uh, uh, wasn't uh, um, as easy before. So really trying to get the students to uh, uh, help us as it were, draw up the uh, um, a, a kind of framework in terms of how we will then build the, uh, 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 the, the the immersive tech and pedagogical tools that the uh, um, the project you know that's the the, the the aim of the project. So bearing in mind, I mean, COVID was 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 a, has been a brutal experience for all of us. But thinking specifically about the student experience in terms of learning, uh, both bad, you know both positive and negative, how you know from our experience with bus bar students how how is that how is that uh, um how was that dealing with the students who've, who've, who've been affected uh by covid over the last year i mean i think an overwhelming positive thing was that, uh, that lectures were recorded and that i i don't think i've met one student who hasn't thought of that having access to recorded information was was not anything but a good thing. So um, I think um, definitely experienced a few students who you mentioned before, Ian, about people who just don't have the technology. So, you know, come to uni, even can be well into uni and don't have a laptop. 
they don't have access to technology, don't have Wi-Fi at home, don't have uh, Wi-Fi that is reliable. That that I you know the, the university offering the the laptop loan scheme and um, some funding to help address Wi-Fi issues. I think was absolutely brilliant because that was definitely a you know technological problem in terms of COVID. Um, yeah, I, I, I realise it's slightly different, but I, I, I remember uh, um, working with students a few years ago, uh, uh, one of whom did not have a laptop and did pretty much all their interacting with the university through their phone, yeah. and then would simply be in a computer room when they needed to write. And uh, um, and you realise how so much of what we were sharing was presupposing that they had you know a screen that was big enough to be able to read in the way that um and uh, uh, and yet they were able to you know manage and it was only when things were getting very difficult or there were particular uh, uh, expectations that you saw that, that 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 didn't work and i imagine with covid where they weren't able to get to a computer room that would just make that even more mm. challenging exactly and maybe not having easy access to your friendship groups or your group so you can't check out so you can't say you know I've missed this. Can I? Um, have I got this right? Or what is it we've got to do by whenever? So I think that as well kind of must have had an impact. Um, and and coming back to that question about asking, I think I think um, and we talked about confidence and the importance of students feeling that they can ask. The online platform actually, in some ways, makes perhaps makes that more difficult. In the you know, in order to have a, a, a what might be a kind of casual conversation that would that a student would feel they could uh, uh, um, use as an opportunity suddenly has to be oh i have to write an email and then set up a meeting or i have to speak in front of others online and and so that that suddenly becomes a more uh, a, a greater challenge do you think confidence has, has been really badly affected in terms of this student experience during the last year Gosh, i don't know I, I think i think you you, you guys probably would know more than than i would I think it can depend. I think sometimes your confidence can increase, doesn't it? If you if you have the recordings and you can go over them and you you become sure of your your kind of information, then maybe you, it can increase. Um, yeah, I don't know. What what are your thoughts, Bridget? I think I think. I mean, I don't have data on this, but in terms of the academic skills gap, I think that's widened um, because of. The, the route that students have come into university, you know, having not gone, not essentially been examined um, in the way that they would have done before. So that building of skills around, you know, that you would would have been a natural part of the progression for most students doing A levels was was kind of not there in the same way. And I think also because we're a university that has, you know, low um, entry requirements. And students that are on art and design courses, you know, their strength is their artistic ability. That, that you know, I think that gap that already existed in terms of academic skills widened, and I think that's something that's really key is to build that into into the first year, but certainly the first semester is an expectation that there's going to be a gap that needs to be filled because certainly the um, I always forget what it stands for, but there's a module called hacks which is essentially the theory, theory module of art and design courses that you know causes enormous distress to a lot of students um, particularly those with specific learning differences because of that lack of you know academic skill set really thank you thank you we've got a few more minutes any any comments questions uh, um, we do have a couple of colleagues from Bath Bar here so you might want to chip in on, on the bar spa perspective, but Andrew. Uh, yeah, so I, I put a comment in the, in the box as well. I, I think a lot of it is about confidence, but it's also about interaction. So I think students who uh, feel weaker or feel less confident sometimes take a back seat or don't get involved in an, in an exchange. And if you're not doing an exchange of some sort, you, you don't uh, internalize uh, what you're learning so well. So just catching up with a recorded lecture is not nothing like as good as actually being there and asking a question or being involved in a dialogue of some sort. And uh, I, I do uh, reiterate the, the, the uh, 
worry about hacks, which is uh, historical and critical studies. That's what it stands for in the schools of art and design. Uh, it's a terrible acronym, but there we go. Uh, and lots of people do feel worried about it. But I think in my experience, I used to teach uh, within contextual studies. And if you can get people to recognize the, the value of their perceptions and the value of their engagement, uh, then they often get over that hump and then see it as being really useful. So, so a lot of it is kind of inertia because they've often come from a background where their, their academic ability has been subject to scrutiny and they don't feel that they that they uh, score well in it. So they try and uh, move away from it, but actually that's counterproductive for them. So I think it's really important to just get them to exchange ideas uh, physically in the world if possible, but virtually in the world if not. Yeah, I think some good points there, Andrew. I think um, I agree that you know students interacting in live sessions is is really key to learning. I think the, the the thing around recording of material is that for disabled students, particularly those with specific learning differences, and and also to an extent those with mental health conditions, um, are not using the recording generally as an alternative to attending. They're using it to to be able to absorb the information because it's actually too much to absorb live and um so it's it's being it's reiterating learning as opposed to an alternative way um, yeah i take that point yeah so that, that that that's really interesting and i think one of the uh um something again that's going to be quite in well it's going to be very important to the project and i think quite distinctive is that we will uh be recruiting a, a group of students per partner who collectively uh, um, uh, uh, have identified that they uh, um, are affected by one or more of these accessibility barriers and they're going to work alongside us throughout the project um, and they're going to be there to uh, um, share their experiences um, you know inform our decisions uh, hold us to account um, but we want to see them very much as collaborators and, 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 you know, one of the ways that we're going to hopefully recruit them is to say that this will be a, a, a valuable experience for them to be able to strengthen that kind of collaborative and, uh, uh, um, kind of group, those group skills, uh, and particularly their confidence because they will be treated as equals. This is not, you know, they're not going to be assessed. If anything, they assess us. So for us, it will, it, it will uh, um, hopefully for those students who by definition will be coming from, from, from groups that will uh, feel often uh, uh, marginalized, I'm hoping that that will be uh, uh, an empowering uh, space as a group to be able to you know, not only shape the project, but also feel that they are contributing directly to how they and their fellow students are taught and will be taught so so that's something um and, and i know that um as a project we'll be talking quite a lot about how we recruit them and how we support them and we will also want to make sure that student support teams at all of the partners are part you know are, are part of the support network behind those students so they're aware of you know what support they're getting from us as a project but then also what kind of support uh, as students at their universities they can get uh, um, through student support so it may well be that you will see those students coming to you having realized that actually they can come to you in a way that might not have been the case before um, so so i'm really looking forward to, to to seeing how we can work with those students and we may well come back to you for for advice on 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 how best to uh, 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 guide them and support them uh, um, so uh, a few other uh, um, uh, modes of evaluation. Well, that's really useful, Daryl. Thank you. We'll follow up on that. Uh, um, and uh, um, yeah, uh, um, good points there about uh, um, the way in which recording. I think I must say I've, I've experienced this with conferences and have approached this with conferences. That some conferences say, "Oh, we've got the recordings," and then they, there's a Google folder. And and what I we've done with another project where we had a conference, we we reformatted the conference program so that all the recordings and presentations and chat and so on were embedded in the program, and then provided that as a resource in itself. 
So, you know, sometimes sometimes actively thinking about how the recordings and how the learning materials can be then uh, uh, um, reused and structuring it in a way I think can be really valuable as well. So um, I think um, and that's something we will, we haven't talked about yet in the in the project, but we will do with our um, University of Arts uh, London team who are leading on developing the immersive platform is to what extent uh, um, we'll be able to uh, um, kind of record and then sort of play back or return to interactivity that's 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 taking place online.